which is upside down on this map here, is um, is the closest way to get to Antarctica. You can get there from New Zealand and from Hobart as well, but most trips travel to Antarctica um, by Argentina. That little gap there between Antarctica, between Antarctica and Argentina, is a thousand kilometers wide. So this was arriving in Ushuaia. This is uh, a beautiful little town, or it's known as the world's most southernmost city. Uh, it's at 53 degrees and 48 points south. Um, there is a smaller town slightly more south in, in Chile, uh, which is closer to the 55th parallel, but it, there's only 3,000 inhabitants, so it doesn't qualify as a city, um, whereas Ushuaia does. When I arrived, I was terribly jet lagged and um, I settled into staff housing for a couple of days and explored the town. Um, I have a couple, couple of other staff members with me. I had Jason from Canada, Steph from Scotland, Brandon and Francis arrived from South Africa. So we got to know each other for a few days. Um, their roles were expedition leader, photographer, geologist and general guide on board. Um, that little video I showed you is of the king crabs. I was told that that was what I had to get while I was there. So I ordered the king crab omelet and um, didn't actually find it all that special. So I'm not sure what they were raving about, but uh, look at the size of them. They're huge. Um, everything in Ushuaia is extremely touristy as you can often come to expect in South America. And everything had the logo Fin del Mondo, which translates as end of the world, which is their big claim to town. Big claim to fame in this city. So in early evening, I arrived in early evening and I was terribly jet lagged. So it was about 16 degrees Celsius, not too cold. It's quite a compact little city and very easy to walk around. And in doing so, I just saw that the light for the late evening. This was probably about eight o'clock at night. Um, it gave me my first glimpse of how soft and glowy it could be this far south. So I was starting to get a little bit excited by that. Oh, I keep pressing that one that's what I want. Um, I couldn't ignore the light, so I stayed out to quite late just to catch that beautiful um, golden glow. Uh, the next morning, we got on board the boat by about 9 a.m. The guests weren't coming on until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but if you were staff, you had the opportunity to get on board early and um, settle in and meet up with the previous um staff or any staff that you were taking over from. So I was taking over from Jay. He gave me a tour around the ship and uh, we spent quite a few hours sorting out all the problems that he had had with the pilot um, version of the program. Um, he did a lot of work. So um, a lot of, he had told me that a lot of the program guests had, had booked into the program and arrived without laptops or SD cards. Um, or knowing how to edit anything. So um, we took everybody uh, from advanced photographers to absolute beginners with iPhones. Uh, that was the aim of the program. You had, there was no prerequisite that you had to have to, um, to enter the program. Um, the, uh, my program, the first one wasn't full. So we set up some more advertising, um, allowing people to take up the remaining places once they got on board the ship. Um, you can see the little um, photography program we set up here on the left to advertise the spots there. Um, Intrepid unfortunately had advertised it as rent the gear. So you pay for the program and rent the gear, but that wasn't the case. You paid for the program and you received the gear for free. So um, um, that was quite a difference. Um, and so we wanted to, I wanted to advertise that. So the two fellow photographers that I worked with, um, we set up a little skit to play on board. Um, and this was the first night with the guests. So we, Jason from Canada and Rune from, from Norway just took some of my cameras and made a little skit about joining the program. But you can see behind there, there is um, the, on, the, on the screen behind, it says the rental program, which was off the Intrepid website.
so that was how we advertised just tried to and i think that first night we pulled in another five people um we had the benefit that a lot of these people on the um, intrepid slash chimu tour on this boat had paid for their trips pre-covid and then had been put off for two years in a row so they'd long forgotten about the money they'd spent on the trip getting down here um but um and then so they were happy to fork out extra for the program if they wanted to i just um there's a couple of in chat you're monitoring chat yeah tim's just sitting off to my right if if you don't know that so um pardon i don't know has victor got sound okay okay uh okay so oh, okay so this is another little video um uh, as we left port that night bit of a cloudy night with a hint of sun of a sunset there were four to eight ships on the dock at any time during the day and uh, it was really great to be around everybody else that was really excited about being on board so that was one of the really pleasurable things about being you know on the cruise um should have had my long camera with me there at the time because what i didn't realize it was you leave the dock you um the ship's um engines they they throw up all the silt from the bottom of the water, bottom of the ocean, and that dig throws up all the crabs and the krill and the little fish. And so the bird life at the dock goes absolutely crazy nuts and collecting up all sorts of little treasures. So I learned that. And when I came back to dock and left dock and came back again and out again, um, I learned to have my camera ready for those um, little bit of easy shooting. It's the first evening out and um, this fellow in front of me was soon to be my friend so that was nice and we just enjoyed as we got way out we were still in the beagle channel by this time uh, that took us a couple of hours to leave the beagle channel and get out onto the ocean but it was a beautiful evening so on board the adventure staff there were amazing resumes of the adventure staff they were full of historians geologists naturalists kayakers mountain climbers people who had wintered in antarctica which was a thing i didn't realize it was a thing um marine biologists glaciologists seal experts whale experts penguin experts bird experts and they all ranged in in ages from their 20s right down to their you know 80s 70s or 80s as well such was the depth of their experience so that was another plus of being on board with all these amazing people that had these wonderful resumes and just there was just so much to learn from them every day um, every night we had a different lecture this is martin cohen who lives in cairns uh, he was giving he was a penguin expert or a bird expert so he was giving us a lecture on penguin evolution um, the days were full on board even though we had spent 48 hours close to 48 hours crossing the drake passage we there was really any downtime you know the captain woke you at seven o'clock each morning with the only overhead into your room to give you the location of where we were what the weather was what outings were going to happen we went out on the outings we were back on the ship by 11 with a hot chocolate we had lunch at 12 we were back out for the afternoon outing at two and then we came back at five and then it was time for the day spa and then drinkies at six and then dinner at seven and then if you're in the camera group there was a camera group at nine and then it was on repeat again for the next day so very little downtime at all um, 6 p.m. every day we'd have a daily briefing um, the expedition leader would update us on the itinerary which looks nothing like uh, what was advertised in the brochures and uh, and they've got little control over that um, they would always change dependent upon the winds and the weather and the other vessels that are around us at the time on this windy.com map that he used you can see that orange is about 35 mile an hour winds the red is 45 mile an hour winds the green is about 10 to 20 mile an hour winds the little red square in the middle is where he's sending us to tomorrow so he's trying to get us sheltered around that bluff of land there to keep us out of the wind um, on the left hand side uh your phone i don't know if people realize this but your phone the map on your phone actually works by gps so although i didn't have any internet or very minimal internet um i got a little dot on my phone every day to tell me where i actually was um so uh the, re the internet didn't work very well on this ship it did work really well on other ships but it was very expensive when we had it it was a hundred us dollars for 60 minutes total and you had to log on and log off and if you forgot to log off well you know there you go your 60 minutes and your hundred dollars and it was very patchy so um 
when I had it, I didn't really feel like using it. I kept it just in case, but I, I was too overwhelmed by the trip, everything that was going on the trip to want to engage with anything back home. And I had thought that I would be that way. So I had set up with my family, um, a, um, I set up with my family a link on the cruise tracker website um, so that they could actually see they all around the world. So they log into the Antarctic area and then they can see the 30 or so cruise ships that are going up and down through Antarctica at any time. They could see where Ocean Endeavour was. So they um, would um, they'd work out where we were. So I had a sister in the US uh, who's very travel addicted. So she tracked me every day and then she reported back to the family to decide what I was actually doing each day with the time. Um, the first time I got back into land, there were about 100 messages there. Um, I got back into port and had good internet and I was able to log into the family messages. So that was a bit of fun. Hold that thought, Jen. <laughs> um, so we travelled down the Beagle Channel and out into the into the Drake Passage, which is known as one of the world's, or if not the world's most treacherous um, body of water in the ocean. It connects the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans between Cape Horn, which is the southernmost part of South America, and the South Shetland Islands about 100 miles to the north of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, as I mentioned before, due to the convergence of the oceans, it's a very unique climatic area. It's a transitional zone between cooler, more humid subpolar areas and more frigid Antarctic. Um, so it's reflected in the bird life. And once out onto the ocean, um, you would see petrels and albatross, um, uh, four southern fulmars. So this, the top left picture is of some petrels. And you can see they've got a little thing on their nose called a tuber nose. As well. And the, this bird on the right is the black-browed albatross. And I can't see his tubernose, but it must be there somewhere. So the tubernose allows them to drink seawater because they live out on the ocean for up to 42 years at a time. Um, they come in to have their babies, if anything, but um, then they're out on the ocean. And uh, the albatross has the world's largest wingspan of up to 10 feet. And all those, these pictures don't reflect it. And it was pretty hard to get perspective because they were floating around off the back of the, off the stern of the boat. And then they, um, and you can't really see how large they were, but uh, they're bigger than a condor um, and bigger than any of our eagles for sure. So, um, so the shorebirds, uh, the seabirds, have, they've got a pair of super orbital glands, um, which, it filters out the salt out of their kidneys, um, draws the salt ions out of the bloodstream, and that, that allows them to drink the water that they live in. So that is how they survive out at sea. But they circle the stern for hours on hours. And um, the, the seabirds, they've got a tendon that runs across the back of their wings and across their back, which, which allows them to not flap for hours and hours and hours. And it was the most beautiful sight to just see them floating in figure of eights. And we would wonder sometimes when they dipped right down really low to the water, whether they'd have to flap like crazy to get out of a bit of the backwash of the boat. But they didn't. They just sort of pulled themselves up and floated away. So um, really amazing behaviour that... Um, I didn't expect to see, and I didn't know it was beautiful to see. So there you go, Jen. There's the crossing, one of the crossings of the Drake Lake, <laughs> colloquially known as the Drake Lake or the Drake Shake. You can either get it as smooth as silk or the trip from hell. Um, I had both crossing. Um, and I'm not very good at seasickness. Um, so that was one of the challenges for me. Um, we had 48 hours to go to the shelter of the peninsula to get away from the boats. Um, any if you have a sideways rock, it's really bad. But if you've got a head on rock, if the waves are coming into the boat, then it's a lot of a smoother trip. So this was the ship swimming pool and it had been emptied on one of the trips. I think this is coming back on one of the trips. So um, five metre swell. Okay, five. Okay, there you go. So Tim said they tracked it and it was a five metre swell. Uh, it was certainly enough. Um, there were sick bags, seasick bags were lining the corridors everywhere so that you didn't have to reach very far for anyone. There were quite a few people, um, you know, that would proudly announce 
prior to the trip that um, they never, ever get sick. very ordinary or just standing there staring blankly into their scrambled eggs at breakfast, you know, and I suspect they were the ones that had proudly declared they were fine and hadn't, um, had failed to, um, had failed to take any medications, yeah. As for me, I've got a history of being struck by lightning and a strong history of, um, <laughs> just as an aside, um, a severe vertigo and migraines, familial history, um, which has resulted in vertigo and seasickness, which left unchecked dissolves into just um, very bad vertigo. So I had dosed myself up with every drug available under the sun and I had a plan and I had a plan B and I had a plan C. So, um, so I realised and that, that that started with not ever allowing myself to feel sick. So rather than getting sick and then trying to wreck the, I, I didn't allow myself to ever get in that position. Um, and got used to, my body got used to the rocking he fell out of his bed one night on one crossing because <laughs> he got rocked out of the bed and I sadly I lost a lens one night as well I had left it on my bedside table instead of I used to put everything in my drawer but I'd left it on the bedside table and being overnight and, and smashed the front um, glass so that was a bit of a shame Anyway, I had a plan and I survived. That was a big tick for me. <laughs> Bit of valid off the anaesthetic trolley, Des. <laughs> worked wonders. And then um, nausea calm, which I think um, that worked really well for me. Um, yeah, she's a, you're a clever girl, Lauren. <laughs> you're better than me. <laughs> um, so there was a ship contest to see who could predict the time of arrival within sight of land the foyer and the winner was supposed to get something I didn't win so I can't remember what it was the winner actually got anyway I put it down for 3am and um and I was out by about an hour and a half so you can see me looking very glamorous in this picture um however we've just entered Nico Harbour and I'm very Coffee. This is um, 2 a.m. I'd asked the sunrise was going to be. So he told me it was early. So full of my seasickness drugs, I got up and um, captured the first light as we came into the harbour. And for me, that was, I was felt so privileged to be there. There were about five other people up with me at the same time, five other people that had the vision, you know, to experience our first glance of, you know, the wild, magical, snowy vista. And the peak, some of the peaks were over two, two and a half, three thousand metres high, and they just soared out of the clouds. So um, that really um, imprinted myself, it imprinted itself on my memory. The woman in the bottom picture, um, just taking a photo, she had paid for her three kids to come along and um, she wanted them all to get up this early to have the last glance. But none of the little blighters would only get up, get, none, of them, none of them would get up with her. So she was up there on the bridge on her own. So I felt a bit sad for her. Um, the temperature was about minus two at this time. And um, as we got closer to the mountains, um, the photo at the top, I was using a 400 mil lens on. So I took a 400 and a 600 down with me and the 400 was universally more utilised on land, but the 600 um, was quite good. So, you know, I had gone expecting some huge landscapes, but um, what I didn't expect was tears on the bow at, you know, three o'clock in the morning with my first glance of the harbour. And I had no sense at all how soft this really pastel light was going to be and how blue it everything would be. And I stayed out for ages and ages and it, I was quite teary about it. And it was nice to be around other people that felt the same. Um, later on into the trips, I got a system of dashing out at around 2 a.m. each night, um, throwing on my tracky decks over the top of my pajama pants and in my slippers and grabbing a camera, having a camera ready loaded to go. If there was no sunrise happening, then I'd just wander back to bed. But if there was, then I was sort of ready to, you know, shoot what was out there. Um, we had about 20% of it was lovely, glowy sunrises. And because it was still reasonably early season, there was still a lot of um, mist and fog and a bit of snow around. Uh, there's one of the first, yeah, that's one of the first um, mountain tops that I took and really I've done no adjustments to that as well, you know, that just the light was just so soft and glowy.
This is Nico Harbour again. Top of these peaks was beautiful. beautiful. And, there, and this is what you would often find. Sometimes you would see mountains where there was no sense of the mountain top, and then all of a sudden the clouds would part above, and you would just see these huge, huge vistas rising into the air. The air. So this was a picture that I shot late one evening. Um, we could see this big tabular iceberg, which we got in the Weddell Sea, which is the eastern side of the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's known for these big tabular icebergs. Um, unfortunately, I shot in JPEG. You know, I could have could have shot myself for doing that, but anyway, I've managed to resurrect the picture and the reverse sunset happening. While well, there was a bit of yeah. <laughs> um, And um, I'm proud to say this is one of my tracking deck pictures early in the morning. So when we settled into the harbour, this was about eight o'clock off the stern of the boat with Jason. You see the colours are very deep, deep blues, and it's very harsh light already. Um, you know, it's quite contrasty. There's no wind. There's very calm waters and so many reflections. So at this point, we're waiting for the exploratory zodiacs to come back um, from land and say that they've found us a safe landing site. Um, and then we would be ready to board the zodiacs and go out for the morning. Look at those reflections. Oh, my God, it just takes me back. back. Oh, there. So there we go. So, um, so the photography program um, participants were either the last or the first start, and um, that allowed us a little bit of it. Um, a little bit of extra time and space to uh, to be on land without so many people around. And you'll see a little bit while later why it made quite a challenge, but um, um, that was what we got as one of the privileges. This is the first cruise that we're taking up. This is a little video clip of traveling back in the Zodiac. Um, often we'd have a half hour to one hour cruise around on the way back, whereas the other Zodiacs went back to the the ship we would cruise around looking for little vistas um, you'll see every zodiac keeps location with both the bridge and other boats if they see any wildlife or the, the bridge can keep an eye on where exactly they are yeah. sorry what was that Try. Um, there wasn't a lot of point taking the tripod. I'll show you um, a little clip later on and you'll understand why. I did, however, thank goodness, I, um, I made the right choice. I made the right choice to take a, a monopod with me and the monopod I brought on land with me just about every day. That was worth its weight in gold. I did have a tripod um, and I did use it with a 600 when I was on the deck sometimes, but most of the time it stayed in my room. Um, so this was the photography program. Um, my role was to pair people with camera gear that they thought they might want to use. So uh, we'd chat with everybody and decide, you know, what their goals were for their photography and what suited them. Not everybody wanted a long lens. Some people just wanted something easy to carry. I know Lauren, she just wanted something simple to carry along and I couldn't persuade her to take one of the bigger ones. So but she enjoyed what she had and that was exactly our aim. Our aim. There's life on the boats uh, with Deb and Narelle. You know, in the middle of the day, if you had a little bit of downtime, you could sneak out of the wind. If the boat was on the move to another location, then you could sit down out of the wind and just enjoy the passing view there. Uh, and this is us on a second trip with some of the photography participants. Um, I really like this photo because it, it's a little bit silly, but we were trying to get everybody to look in the one direction and um, and we couldn't get it together. So, um that was quite funny. These were some of our photography participants with windy hair right in the background. Most people on board participated in the um, in the polar plunge um, program. This uh, um, I didn't choose to because I know how it ends. Throwing my head into freezing cold water sends me straight into migraine, so I knew that that wasn't going to be happening for me. This lady on the left, this little Jap Japanese lady on the left, she didn't know how to swim, but she was so determined to do the polar plunge. Everybody was attached by a harness, so they weren't going anywhere. And if they um, were too shocked by the experience, they were it was 
they were easily pulled out of the water. So I stood right up on the top deck with a long lens and I shot off about 100 photos of people diving into the water. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. The water is only just above freezing. It's about one degree or two degree. Uh, this, these are some of the photography participants. On the left is this lovely lady, Nadia, from Paris. She wanted a really fast, easy, adaptable light, you know, combo to use. So I partnered her up with a 7R3 and a 70 to 240 lens, and she wanted to stay with that combo for the entire trip. The fellow next to her is Chris from Tasmania. He had had a Canon gear before, and it had a long lens, and he it was too fussy and too much for him to carry anymore. So he wanted something that would do anything. So I paired him up with the Sony RX10, which is um, 24 to 600 zoom. It's a little powerhouse for a travel camera. And he absolutely loved it, loved it. That's right. That's the same as your camera, Elspeth. Um, Chris has got his iPhone on a lanyard and in a waterproof pouch. And if you're heading down that way to Antarctica, 100% do this. Your iPhone, iPhones disappeared overboard every day by people and staff. And um, just by hanging it around your neck meant that you could just drop it, okay? You, we did have, we could take backpacks with us there on the floor of the Zodiac before. Um, a waterproof bag is an absolute must. This is quite rare, this picture of sunshine and quite a pleasant cruise because the weather could turn on a dime and we often were soaked in our clothes before we got back to the boat on the travel to and from the boat. So you didn't want to wreck. You had to have your camera gear sorted out and kept dry. Oh, that's a little video. Hang on. I'll go back. That's a little video of one of our first tries. What have I done there? Um, most people on the on staff were uh, had a lot of skills to their names. So Jason, who was a photographer for um, Pierre Trudeau, I think back in the 80s, um, for about 10 years or so, he could also write a Zodiac, so expedition leader. So they had to multi-skill at things. I, I didn't come down multi-skilled, but um, except that I'm a nurse at a background. And um, Des, you'll be very excited to know that there was a code blue in the breakfast room one morning. So um, I, the ship doctor knew that I had some skills in that direction. So I, I was pretty excited that I was able to assist and um, and help. And this person had overdosed on their seasickness medication. Uh, they had put patches on and then thought they were feeling unwell. So they'd put another two patches on and that was not the right thing to do. Yeah, take two. That's all you need. You just need long. 400 is perfect. 600 is a little bit long. 600 is great, but 400, 100 to 400 will shoot you about 85% of your shot. And if you only wanted to take two, take a 24 to 70 because um, you can take a wide lens, but because you're shooting the wide landscapes from the ship, you know, they turn out really wide. You're much better to be able to zoom in closer on them or um, get them with the 24 to 70. So those would be my two recommendations. And they were the two most heavily used items out of the kit that I lent out to people. Leave your 12 mil at home. Um, so we had a lot of international guests um, in this boat. We've got two Parisians, we've got a Canadian, we've got an Englishman, we've got a Norwegian, we've got a Scot, and then there's me standing up in the middle with the blue floral hat in. The Zodiacs are stable enough to stand up in. Um, kneeling was better uh, if you wanted to stabilise your camera, but it's very hard on the knees down there. And uh, I apologise to my photography group in advance that I'm a serial bouncer. I can never sit still while I'm shooting. I get too excited about what I'm seeing or the potential of what is about to come up. Um, the clients laughed in one group and had feedback that later on, you know, they learnt to see what I was seeing. So I guess that was, you know, mission accomplishment. You know, I was seeing, I'm seeing shapes and I'm seeing incoming wildlife potential or an angle to appear in an iceberg or the direction of the light or the good light, complementary shapes or, you know, reverse angle images. So I sort of, you know, had a swivel head like an owl, really. Um, and I said, look, I'll share my thoughts as they spill out of my brain so that you know where to look. 
Rene, the Norwegian um, photography guide, third photography guide, he was great at manoeuvring the Zodiac back and around and bringing us into the right angles as well. So um, he's really got some skills in that direction. So I labelled this photo why I look like a Teletubby. Um, it's all about layering in Antarctica. You see, I don't have a hat on, but it, within two seconds later, I might need a hat on. So it's all about layers, layers and layers. Um, underneath, I've got a long sleeve woolen T-shirt on, um, usually with a woolen jumper over the top. Um, Intrepid gave us a puffy jacket to wear. And I had also bought my uh, my lightish down puffy as well. That's right. Yeah. So and. Layer, layer, layer. Um, so I had outer waterproof, the outer layer that the boat gave us, they loan you the blue jackets for the portion of the trip and they give you the in, inner, their version of the inner jacket. Um, so they give you the outer one. You don't have to wear that, but they heavily lean on you to wear it so they can identify you. Um, and it's got a mandatory hood on the background, uh, back on the back of my head. And boy, did I use that hood sometimes. Um, always carried a beanie with me and we couldn't take our life jackets off while we were on land. Um, so under my ski pants, which are padded, I had one or two layers on my legs, depending on the day. Uh, generally, I overdressed because even if it was a lovely day and we we're going out at two o'clock in the afternoon, by three, four o'clock, you know, the weather could have dropped five degrees below zero and Boy, that was a long zodiac ride back if you were feeling cold and it was wet. Always took two pairs of gloves with me. I've got my ski gloves there and I've got another little pair of liners stuffed into my pocket somewhere. Um, they give you gumboots to wear. They, they size you up before the trip, give you gumboots and um, you can either wear your thick socks if you're a believer in thick socks. I like a single pair of thin wool socks and I don't generally have problem with cold feet. So that was enough to keep me okay. Um, this is about the temperature sort of veered from about minus two to plus two um, without wind. So this is one of the places we stopped at, Portal Point, and um, you have to stay on the tracks. And this will hark back to the question about whether it's worth bringing a tripod. Um, and I'll show you why. Um, the mountaineers would come on land first and they'd source the hardest snowpack to walk on. There's quite treacherous drops offs as the snow melts through the season here. Um, you can see just on this video here, you have to stay on the track to walk. So if you try to put a tripod down there, you are just annoying a whole lot of people. Um, yeah, but in the soft, well, that's right, you do get a bit of movement in the soft snow. Um, so you can see the kayakers, where are the kayakers? Oh, out the back, anyway. And as we've got, I'll just go back a little bit. Uh, back. Okay, down there in the middle of the picture near the water, you can see a little um, sausage on the water there, and that's a Weddell seal. I saw him, we visited this time, this area three times on the trips that I did, and he was always in the same spot. So obviously that was his favourite um, hangout spot. And the people closest to him, you get, they're not, you're not allowed to close, enter um, any closer than 25 metres. So um, uh, that was uh, part of the IATO rules that we were, had to obey. Quite steep walking down there. There were a couple of people that bought hiking poles, 80-year-olds um, that wanted to use hiking poles and probably a good idea because the snow, by the time everybody stepped on the snow, it could get quite slippery underfoot. And people generally didn't slip over, but if you weren't didn't feel so sure underfoot, you could have easily. Oh, did you have snow there, Sarah? No, um, I'm just actually looking at this photograph and I find it there, were, it, there was snow, but it looked very different a month later, a lot less snow. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite pretty now, isn't it? <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so back to the ship. Um, here's a little, this is how we get back to the ship. You chose the side that we got on dependent on the prevailing winds. Um, to keep us safe. There was a very strict protocol on how you got on and off the boat. You had to keep your arms inside as the deck crew tied up the boat, at the two ends of the boat. You had to stand up when you were chosen to stand up, take the forearm of the Zodiac driver, pass your bag to the deck crew, take the deck crew's forearm, step on the edge of the Zodiac and then step onto the platform and you must obey. Otherwise you would have been named and shamed. So that 
obviously is a very calm landing, but one landing we had, um, we had to hurry back to the ship because a storm had blown up and, oh man, it was crazy. If I didn't have those lovely little boys there, lovely boys helping hold, we would have, there's no way I would have been able to get onto the ship by myself. Uh, so here, this is a little bit of juxtaposition, this photo. You can see I haven't even edited it because there's a big dirty mark on it. But this just, I put this one in because it shows the challenges, um, some of the challenges that you had to face. Um, this was in a non-photography zodiac and uh, we were somewhere, it wasn't Danko Island, I can't think where we were this morning, but look at the conditions, absolutely flat, calm reflections, a beautiful dark stormy sky behind and I'm in a boat with non-photographers and I really wanted to get my 24 to 70 to lean over the edge and put it into the water or on top of the water. Um, I've got this little technique where I just put my hand under the camera. The strap is always 100% around my neck but I've got my hand under the camera so that I can feel the water before I hit the um, before the camera hits the water but um, this lady wouldn't move out of my way. She didn't want to move a spot, she didn't want to move and um, and so that made me a little bit frustrated because I didn't like not having total control and missing the moment. So I missed some good pictures because oh, because she wanted to be there. Uh, up to 200 on a ship, we had about 130 on one cruise and 150 on, on another cruise. If you have more than 200 people on a ship, you cannot land on Antarctica. You can only land... Uh, 100 people at a time on land you have to stagger them and then you have to only be there for a morning or an afternoon and you have to leave and make way for other cruise ships in the area so the big net geo ships uh, big cruise liners that are 15 stories high they can't step foot anywhere on land in antarctica so that's why you'll find most of the ships have a really reasonable size of people um, if you're quite intrepid, uh, because the ships weren't full early in the season, people still weren't confident enough to travel after COVID. If you arrived in Ashwaia, there were travel agents everywhere selling backpackers, tours, 50, 60% off the ships as they departed the port. So there were a couple of backpackers on, on our trip that had been travelling around South America for a while and scored themselves a nice cheap trip, a luxury trip that's nice and cheap. So I didn't expect this in Antarctica. Yeah, I didn't expect such stillness and soothing, beautiful curves with soft light, pictures with no distractions. You know, and this I only saw this one morning, and um, and then I never saw anything like it again. And I, I, it's one of my most favourite photos because there's not much there, but it sums you know the area up beautifully. And then you know, and then I got lucky bonus points for a Gen Two penguin walking along. So. <laughs> That's right, Pipo. <laughs> there he is. Um, you know the 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 start the, the simplicity of color and form just blew me away. And if we had dark, moody skies in the background, you know, it would bring up some of the most beautiful color combinations. And I, it was an unexpectedly spiritual moment for me. You know, I'm always one with nature and very um antagonistic towards concrete and freeways and things in my life so I'm not sure what I'm doing living in Sydney but here I am um, so this was you know I just it really resonated with me uh, you would get very moody skies and passing you know soft light coming through as well so um, that would often I in this photo I'd sort of drop the contrast to soften um, some of the, the colors as well it's quite difficult to um, edit a lot of the photos um, anyone that's conversant in photoshop i changed this from rgb mode to lab colors and um, added a curves layer on and i brought out some of the uh, uh, some of the moody colors there that way um, if you don't if you want to know how to use lab color just put a message in the chat and tim will just give you the direction <laughs> um, The camera's not very good. Oh, it's too bright. It's too bright. So, but. <laughs> no. I think you need to turn your mic on if you want to talk. Oh, you can't. Okay, he can't. He can't turn his mic. I forgot that because he's sitting right next to me. So we'll get double sound. Okay, yeah, that's right. He's saying the camera's not very good at picking up the subtlety and the blues, um, and there's so much reflection from sky to birds and everything. So uh, you've just got to do a little bit of work to bring them out. 
Um, you know, some of the shapes can be really difficult to edit. You know, this is in an iceberg graveyard. Um, you know, I found it quite overwhelming because, of course, you know, as a landscape photographer, you're looking at your composition, um, but the shapes are moving as the zodiac's going along or the, the waves are rocking and the winds are blowing and uh, it work could often be, you know, quite hard to find a good composition while you're passing by. And often there's a couple of, sometimes we were late back to the ship or there was a storm chasing us and so we couldn't really slow down. You'd see these beautiful monoliths in the water and you couldn't slow down because you had to get back to the ship. Um, there's another one as well. Just, you know, I just, I could go on for hours and hours and I've left, I brought home almost two terabyte of images and, you know, I've barely touched, scratched the surface with some of them. I keep diving in and finding other lovely ones. Um, some really beautiful images. I just, I haven't edited. These are raw files. Um, and really, I mean, they're very organic in shape and composition. I think they're really beautiful, but well, I rated this, right? Um, but, and I don't know what to do with them because I, I think they're lovely, but I can't put them up. I'm not going to hang them on my wall. I'm not going to compete with them or anything, but there's, you know, the, you know, one's got the light shining through and one is, you know, dead chapel. <laughs> Right, so we'll move on to penguins. Penguins, penguins, you know, they were delightful. They were they were charming, they were cranky, they were inquisitive, they're very vulnerable to the other wildlife around them. Um, there were so many photo ops with them, you know, and there's so many wonderful backdrops to shoot them against as well. So, you know, their behaviour, they're not frightened as, of us. They don't see us as a predator. And, um, you know, they were largely very chilled out. So here's a little um, video that I put together of just of the penguins and just note the wide variety of light conditions. Um, beautiful shape of the iceberg. The boat's really rocking. It's hard to shoot. Um, it's just taken from the Zodiac. Had to do a bit of high key shooting. Try and can take a screenshot of all the comments in there so I can read them afterwards because they'll disappear with the chat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Penguins. Introduction to penguins. Um so you can see I mean, a lot of that's, you know, the boat's really rocky and wobbly, hard to shoot there. And um, although I had a monopod on land, because I had the monopod, a lot of the video is still quite wobbly as well. It's great having the iPhone on a lanyard around my neck because it got too hard. I just dropped my camera um, and picked up the iPhone and did a lot of shooting with that. Highly recommend taking a selfie stick for your um, little iPhone. If you want, it fits nicely in your pocket and it, it was very useful having a selfie stick. You couldn't set the selfie stick on the ground um, because of the threat of avian flu, which is just spreading south really crazily. They're very aware about putting things on ground. So for the most part, we weren't allowed to set anything on the ground. 
Um, I had taken a backpack with me a lot of um, the first couple of trips, thinking that if someone wanted to change lenses, I could change them out to something else. But I very quickly ditched that idea and left them to themselves uh, because I, it was too hard for me to manage, particularly the life jacket and my 57 layers and a backpack it was too awkward. So I tried to lighten my own load so that I could continue to enjoy the moment. Uh, here's little Adeli penguins. Uh, I have no idea how they get up on this berg, but um, they can't jump that high. But I can only imagine that the berg on the back has got a little bit of um, landing to it. There were a couple of other little penguin in the shots beforehand that were jumping off the little iceberg on the beach. The tide had receded. Uh, maybe it's shallow here in this picture. I'm not sure. But we had the zodiacs driving past it. But um, I don't think the tide has receded that high. Um, so these are Gentoo penguins. They're quite cranky little things. Um, um, fabulous to watch. They are quite. They've got different colouring under their um, under their chins. The Adelis have got little round black colouring. The Gentoos have got red red beaks, whereas the Adelis have got little. Um, they've got little black beaks, largely black beaks. We did see some chin strap penguins. I think there's a photo of one down, but they're not, there's not many of them around. The gentos are increasing in numbers and the Adelie penguins, which like to live more out at sea on bergs rather than land, they are decreasing in numbers. So they're rapidly becoming quite vulnerable. Um, I've got a YouTube channel. Do you want to put the link that for the... Um, if you want to put the link, Tim's going to put the link to There's a movie on our YouTube channel. Um, he's just going to pop that into the chat if you want to bookmark that later. And that's got a lot. I took a lot of video of these penguins on this day fighting about, you know, 100 of them all wanting to get on the one same one metre square of ice. And so they were busy, you know, shooting everybody else off while they tried to jump on. So it was quite entertaining. But I've got a whole movie of the trip, which I won't show tonight because I'll be doubling up. Um, here they are, this little one on the left, he's about to be booted off the ice island um, in no uncertain terms. So it was very entertaining. So those are Gentoos. And these are these are Adelie penguins, um, the little googly eyes. These were my absolute favourites. Um, they, you know, this was just the cutest little moment. We were in the Zodiac driving back to the boat and uh, we passed this little ice floe which had a Weddell seal resting on it. These two little delis jumped out of the water and then they got all unsure about how safe they were because there was where, there was a Zodiac on one side and then the Weddell seal was on the other side. So they then nose kissed and they held hands, you know, looking for reassurance from each other. Um, they do mate for life, penguins as well. So, um, Hopefully this was a little loved up here. Easy to find, you know, different compositions for the penguins, particularly as we were often down the bottom of the hill and then you'd look up against the skyline as well. So the penguins, their rookeries were often not always close to the water. They could often be two, 300 metres away from the water and, and up the hill. So they make these little penguin highways in the snow that uh, you had to stay away from all the time. But uh, it did make for great compositions, you know, getting the rookeries in the background of the little passing penguins. The Adelis and the, or, or penguins, they drink fresh water, so they're not like the seabirds. So, um, you know, little bits of icebergs hanging around, they would often bury their nose in for a little snack of fresh water. The, um, this little um, Adelie, I, I snapped a few shots of them coming into the water. Um, they, had, they exhibited this really strange behaviour coming close to the shoreline, which I realised when I got on video I, quite accidentally, I got a, um, the penguins rushing out of the water right on the shoreline and then in the shallows behind there was a seal swimming backwards and forwards past the shallows trying to getting ready to grab any passing penguin. So they swim in the water and they swim very fast, but uh, then when they get to the shoreline there, obviously that's a vulnerable moment for them. So they do this crazy flappery dance to get out of the water and um, I was able to point that out once I realized saw that happening. I was able to point that out to some of the photography participants and uh, check out, um, you know, that as a moment to look for for good photography. This is on the Sony A1 the shot and on my 100 to 400 mil lens, shooting at about 32 hundredths of a second. Most shots um, I stayed on f8. My other two photography guides they wanted everyone to shoot wide open, as wide open as they could. Um, but they came from a background of um, people and street photography, and um, and so they sort of liked those blurry backgrounds. I, I find that with wildlife, 
you know, I will shoot open if I've got a shot, but F8, I find, and even F11 sometimes, if I'm not, if I want the shot and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get it, I'll stay in that safe zone where I've got a deeper focal length. Uh, deeper what? Deeper. <laughs> okay. Um, I usually shoot on auto ISO. Um, in in the bright light on the really bright days, you could you could have shot on around about a hundred ISO or four hundred ISO just to bring up a bit of detail. Um, I'm happy to stick to auto ISO. In fact, I I set out with the goal of shooting more high key, um, so that because I knew that I'd be having black subjects on light backgrounds, and I didn't want to lose the detail in the subjects. I wanted to bring it out. You can see how easily here with these two little gentoos that you can, um, with the contrast, particularly on the one on the left, you could lose all detail in their feathers as well. So they molt um, once a year or so. They stay on land soon after they've had their chicks, when their chicks are about three months old. They've got something like a million feathers uh, there, and that's what protects them from the um, cold waters and of the um, of the cold waters of Antarctica um, while at that time they're molting they can't go in and feed so their chicks a lot of the chicks die of starvation uh, while they're molting and they're not um, able to swim and keep themselves warm so it's a, a central part of their well-being um, and so you can see the, the tiny texture of the feathers in there which is what's something that I wanted to pull out with the way that I was shooting um, the shallow shoreline, you can see how shallow it is here. Um, it made for really excellent pics as the, this little one starts to shoot. He's been swimming in underneath the water, looking for with his head down, looking for krill, and then he shoots up. And as soon as his feet touch the bottom, then he waddles out at top speed out. So that on with the right shutter speed, that made for quite some quite nice photos. So this is a picture I call confliction. <laughs> Quite the irony because, um, you know, seals are the mortal enemy of the penguins. But um, like the like the seals, um, when they're like the penguins, when the seals are hunting, you know, they're the, they're the penguins biggest danger. But when they're molting, they don't eat and they lie around just being miserable all the time. And they're not the slightest bit interested in penguins. So this little gentoo's walked out of the water and um, the seal is directly in his line of sight. So um, this is a in his way so he's like what am I going to do if I walk left or right am I going to get got or not this is a crab eater seal um, one of the there's about three or four different varieties of seals down in Antarctica one of my most favorite excursions was to uh, Gordon Island Gordon Island someone connect correct me Sarah if I'm wrong I just can't remember where we saw the southern elephant seals so this is the largest seal in the world. Um, it's larger than its North American elephant seal cousin. The adult males can weigh up to five tons and they can measure up to 6.5 meters in length. Um, they're called a beach master. So they, um, although they spend the majority of their life underwater in search of food, um, they're deep divers and they feed on squid and fish. Um, but um, their metabolism is very slow and this allows them to conserve oxygen when they're diving. But um, they've got three times more blood in a human and um, the, the haemoglobin carries the oxygen, which allows them to stay underwater for length at a time. They, they stay out, um, they'll stay out in the water for about up to eight to nine months a year and then come on land to have their pups this time. And then they're molting, you can see, is the same as the, um, the penguins. So they're, they're very cranky when they hang around. Well, they, they fart and they burp and they argue with each other and they are endlessly captivating. They stink like crazy, but uh, I, I just love them. So um, the newborn, there's a little um, juvenile here on the right. They weigh 50 kilos when they're born. Um, the one on the left, he's undergoing his catas they're undergoing their catastrophic molt. Um, you know, they lose a layer of their fur as long they lose a layer of skin along with their underlying with the overlying fur. Um, they're very social animals and the way that, the reason they're all squashed together like this is called a harem and there's usually only one adult male um, then so there's largely only females in this these pictures were of females I didn't see the beach master he must have been I don't know asleep somewhere not concerned about anything this is this little sausage is a juvenile um, coming out of the water um, you can see they don't get their big if it's a male they don't get their big um, they don't get their big elephant no elephant truck noses until they've almost reached adulthood. Um, he was lying in the water for ages, and uh, he could he 
the tide came in over the top of him and we wondered if he was going to get up, but he can hold his breath for up to two hours at a time. So um, he actually prevented us from reaching the zodiacs. Uh, sorry, prevented us from reaching the zodiacs because he was swimming around and um, took us half an hour to get back to the boats because of him. It's quite dangerous, of course. And behind the other group of people, behind the group of people is the harem over the back there, which he's wanting to get to. So we had to sort of scoot around out of their way. Um, big lump of blubber. Jab of the heart, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so some of the birds here, this is a skewer and this is a predatory bird. Um, he resembles a gull, but he's a lot more heavily built. And I just really enjoyed shooting them uh, against the white background. Um, I'm shooting very high key because I find it easier to pull down the highlights than to try and pull detail out of the shadows. I'll get a much better response out of the highlights. And, and then I've got all the detail in the animal that I'm trying to shoot. So it's quite deliberate to, to shoot um, quite light. Uh, here he is again, just skimming across the snow. If they skimmed in low, then you've got a beautiful chance to get some lovely shadows as they were coming across the snow. Um, up to 40% of penguin chicks are lost due to the skewers and some of the gulls. They, uh, it was wonderful watching it, but also heartbreaking. It, uh, you know, he came in, he just hovered above these little penguins. They've got absolutely no defence whatsoever. And he literally ripped the egg out from underneath it and flew away with it. Um, the poor little penguins, you know, they just stood there. I watched the penguin mother that had her egg taken away afterwards and she just stood there looking really bewildered and then she started getting cranky at the other birds nearby, you know, and taking her um, grief out on them. Uh, they're known as the avian pirates because, uh, you know, that's what they do. They just fly away the eggs and then they rip into them and eat them and then you would see a lot of these little eggs just um, on the snow left abandoned. Uh, you can see it's covered in krill poo. So because the oceans are really rich with krill, which is what all the marine life, the whales um, and the penguins and things go to feed on. And um, then a lot of the poo is covered in red so that up on the snow, it can get really, let's just go back to this photo. You can see that I've taken the red out of it because it looks awful, but that's not actually mud. That's actually krill poo. <laughs> smells great penguin guano smells great um this is a um a, a cormorant family so he's a blue-eyed shag and sometimes he was uh he'd work against the penguins and sometimes he just lived quite happily amongst them as well so one of the days that we had that was slightly snowing so he was quite picturesque flying it around them their eyes uh, were absolutely beautiful and their what's that little i think it's called nares or snares or something but the top of their nose as well was bright, bright yellow. So they were very picturesque. I enjoyed shooting them. Uh, a couple of little location shots. We've got a little chin strap penguin here on the on the right, talking to a little chentu on the beach. They don't really hang out together, but they don't um, have any issues with each other there. And there's a little, I think he's a crab eater seal, just checking us out as we go by in the Zodiac. So we had to shoot the seals uh, from 25 metres away. They're quite large. These are Weddell seals. Um, there's, they do a whole lot of lying around, really. And, you know, a lot of the time, rarely did we see them in the water, just probably on one, 10% of the time we went out, did we, would we see a seal actually in action? But they do a whole lot of this. And if you can position yourself down low on the snow, we couldn't sit down, but sometimes I could get down a little crouch, down a little bit lower and um, take them with the snow just in front of them as well. So they were very pretty <laughs> and very picturesque. Uh, they would hide themselves away on little rock shelves quite convincingly so that if the penguins didn't know where they were and they swam around to that ice flow over there, um, it was a ploy for their prey um, to be hidden. So that made for good photos behind the ice shelf. I uh, found this Weddell seal. I'm very easily amused by this. You know, it was a, a well-placed snot on, on a Weddell seal. Um, it was just, you know, he lifted his head momentarily inquisitive at us as the zodiac went by and he had this little frozen icicle on the end of his little bit of snot. So um, with a bit of quick thinking, I managed to capture him. These are um, these are noctilucent clouds. 
and I saw them a couple of times and it's all to do with the different the rays of sun somebody that's a cloud expert might be able to enlighten me but uh, you know quite separate from a rainbow in the sky it was just the cloud themselves that were making rainbow storms were a big part um, of the environment you know there every day you would get really low lying cloud cover that would come in if if the, if there was a storm imminent and it just made for really beautiful background photography this is shot from the boat i've probably shot it with a 24 to 70 i did have a 12 mil lens with me did i didn't take the 16 to 35 but there was a 16 to 35 in the kit um but rarely did i use really did i use a wide lens mainly because it's so far away from land most of the time of us to show you know, it's it's a four, four kilometer thick what up and um it's important for it's profound <laughs> so on board sorry just have a drink on board the boat we had um, um, there was a, a, a biologist through that organism and go, go out and do some tech. All that was collected and then put into a big data base. Auto runs, I think, because We've lost your um, uh, screen, Robin. And your audio. I think you're on mute though. I can't hear you. It changed because, okay, should be back now. Can we all see the ice now? Okay, good. Okay, cool. Rosie, give me a thumbs up. Can you see everything? Okay, sweet. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I'll just go back a couple. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so there we are getting into the water in a very orderly fashion, coming back to the boat. Um, this is Amanda um, and um, uh, Lauren, I think. Oh, no, this is the first trip, I think. Um, this is Amanda on the boat taking a lump of ice back for gin and tonic at night time. So pure was it. So she procured a pair and took it back to the ship for evening drinkies. We're in the brash ice here. Um, very hard to shoot. Um, fortunately, I'd brought the 12 mil out with me that day for some reason. So Andrew on the right stood me up on the front of the boat and held on to me um, like the scene from Titanic so that I could get my 12 mil to get a full um, picture out of it. And um, we had a little friend following us in the boat, a leopard seal, so who was not the slightest bit frightened by us. Um, very curious they are, and they're an apex predator. So he's he came to check us out quite brazenly. Uh, we've got a little bit of a storm approaching in the background, so you can see the changes in the light as well. So she came and circled the boat, got closer and closer, popping her head up. And um, I have heard stories that they 
have been known to leap into boats, but fortunately it didn't happen to us at all. Um, there's only very few instances of leopard seals attacking man, but um, they um, generally the, the ships stay away from them by keeping a healthy distance from them. But they, of course, they'll quite happily attack the penguins. And you can see that this um, leopard seal um, has got his penguin lunch. Um, and what they do is that they flip them around from side to side and um, strip them inside out so that they can get to all the juicy meat on the inside. So that sort of behaviour, I have got a little video somewhere of that behaviour. Um, I didn't realise that's what they were doing, but he turns it inside out so he can get all the, to the juicy bits first. The only prey of the um, leopard seal is the orca. Uh, here he is shredding it away. He was he wasn't being fast about doing it. He was probably over you know five minutes or so. He was quite calmly just enjoying stripping down his meal. But awesome to watch. Absolutely awesome to watch. You know, you felt I felt quite in awe of the way that he was behaving there with his little penguin. Is it there? Is that you on the right, Lauren? Is it? And Natalia's got must have a hat on. Okay, there you go. Yay, there you are. Okay, so Spurt Island, absolutely beautiful and quite rocky and the clouds came up and what a beautiful scene this was, you know, very romantic. Um, you, The storms would often appear, you know, over the hill and then the cloud formations were just, you know, absolutely glorious to photograph. Um, couldn't get enough of it. We well, did have to hightail it. Yeah. Um, so Antarctica is basically a desert. You know, it doesn't rain or snow a lot there. And when it snows, the snow doesn't melt, and it builds up over many, many years, and to make large, thick sheets of ice. You know, called ice sheets. <laughs> um, and so you get glaciers, ice shelves, and icebergs, and you get a lot of carving of the icebergs um, at any given time. And that was something that we were always on lookout for in the Zodiac rides because you could hear the ice cracking from miles away and know that something was about to happen. Um, on one day, we did see a, um, a, a, an iceberg carving from us about not all that far away, about 800 metres away from us, and um, it sent a little tsunami into the waters surround we were on land at the time it sent a little tsunami into the waters so um all the staff had to sort of come up off the shoreline but what it did do was it sent the penguins absolutely crazy wild they um they they were up there surfing and swimming around and flashing and i can only guess that it's flipping up all the krill from the bottom of the water and uh, making it easy for them to capture So the weather changes really rapidly from hour to hour. And on this occasion, this is late late at night, after about nine o'clock at night, some catabatic winds blew up. And um, catabatic sounds like acrobatic. Um, they bear resemblance to sort of tumbling, which is sort of by their name like that. But they're essentially winds that flow downhill, also known as fall winds. They, they're usually caused by gravity pulling higher density air um, down into a lower density air. And on this night, they were at about 50 kilometres an hour. And um, I'm just going to show you this. So I'm not sure why they hadn't closed the outside doors because as smooth as this looked, it was pretty wild. Um, I was going out with a camera lens. I went out with a 400 mil lens and a, I passed a woman coming back in and she said, oh, no, no, there's nothing to see here, you know, and you're best off inside. You know, you don't want to go outside. But for me, all I could see was the light coming around the corner and I could see the light and the wind and the waves and the light on the bergs and the roll of the clouds. And um, it's crazy. So it was brutally cold out there. Um, it was about minus 10 with those winds. Um, I had brought the 400 out with me and then I realised that we, what I wanted was those clouds on the land in the distance out there. So I rushed back in and I got the 600. Um, 
and and I shot really fast to try and capture that. You know, the um, didn't bring the monopod out with me, and I didn't really want to. I was moving so fast, so I didn't couldn't set the tripod up. Um, anyway, I rushed off, and I got to put another layer on, and a couple of layers on my head, a beanie, and a balaclava, and everything to try and keep myself warm. And I think I was the only one out there, and I must have stayed out there for about an hour because it was just the most fantastic shooting. And I've come home, literally come home with the. Um, best photos of the trip I think from those this one um I'm very excited to say is is um I'm not going to say what I'm a finalist in a major Australian competition that will go on exhibition later in the year so um this when the bird you can see a black dot on the screen there which is actually one of the birds flying around um they were really enjoying the light and the winds and whatever crazy I don't know how they got it done but um but um, they were really enjoying the moment there. And every direction I looked, you know, the wind, the prevailing winds just whipped up the, 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 the snow and the salt and everything and just created beautiful shapes and beautiful colours with the really low, low light. So I highly recommend that if you're going to Antarctica, you plan to live out there all through the night <laughs> because that is when the light change the contrast drops and the light just changes and the best shooting is about between about 10 o'clock at night and two o'clock in the morning um and forget about sleeping you know it's just overrated really on a trip so nearing the end of my talk and um this i'm just going to put up a couple of images really that stood out for me um this one, of course, you know, I made the Zodiac driver drive around a number of times to get the correct angle when I saw this little iceberg. You know, and it's really, um, you know, I, it's hard to describe Antarctica. You know, is it magical? Is it awesome? Is it breathtakingly pure? You know, how do you, I don't know how to describe five humpbacks breaching around the ship while you're sitting there having a barbecue and drinking in the evening, you know, or how do you describe the little Adelis that, you know, brazenly walking up to you and checking you out or the leopard seal, you know, eyeing you off or, you know, the colours of the icebergs. I don't even know how to describe the colours of the icebergs because they were every tone of blue and white and green, you know, and when the light changed, so did the colours change, you know, and and how do you describe the beautiful crystalline waters that look so inviting, but yet it'll kill you in mere minutes if you um, you know, if you go under that water. So it was it was too much for my brain to process in many aspects of it. And um, I found that, you know, um, it was impossible not to come home the trip and feel changed in some way. You know, it changes your awareness and knowledge of the environment down there. <coughs> and um, and it opens your eyes to um, to life down there in that pristine. And it's a desert, really. Uh, so this was one, of course, one of my favourite images from the trip. And this... And then to top it off the night of the Weddell Sea storm, you know, I, there was the light was so low that it was making these icebergs on the water go blue, you know, and the ferocious winds, you know, it was, it was, um, you had to be really respectful of that. And um, so, you know, the biggest test for me was that of my mind was how to process it. You know, how do I process being in such an environment? You know, the bits that scared me, which, you know, really was for me largely was the, the Drake passage um, left me realizing that simply because it scares me that, that I should embrace it. And that's why I needed to go and do it and overcome that. So, um, you know, when the, the wind screeches in your face and the water whips across you, you're acutely aware of the power of death right in front of you. There's there's no illusion. And so um, I, I tried very hard to settle on a word that would sum everything up, but um, settled on the word that was sublime, which and sublime means both terrifying and mesmerizing. And uh, that is um, and that is how I describe the trip, really. And that's. We've come close to the end of it, but um, um, this little slide here is um, my book, which is going off to the publishers in the next couple of days, and I called it Journey to the Sublime because that's the word that sums up the trip for me there. So so we've basically come to the end there this evening. A um, couple of more slides. Ooh, this is so dodgy, that other screen, okay. Um, if you want to sign up to our, to our mailing list, just visit this, the link there um that i've got the book will be released soon and on for sale in our shop um, i'm going to be doing an, an a3 print giveaway so you just need to sign up for that to the mailing list and i've got a calendar coming out soon and of course our workshops and tours um we do have access to your emails here so if nobody i can add you onto our mailing list and if you don't want to be added in please notice us in chat 
um, we send out very infrequently. 